Do you take this man to be your lawful wedded? I'm John Wayne. Wait. Well, I have... At your service. You cannot have that car tonight. For the past three nights, there hasn't been a drop of gasoline. No, no, that isn't it, Dad. Do you think a fellow should get married young? I have never heard anything like that. Forgot get was get. You can do this. You've been in love with her for three years. I must have her. I feel all this. Swear. There's something I want to tell you. You first. No, no. You first. I'm in love with you. I'm engaged. Great.
Okay, ladies, that video does tie in sort of to the message today. Yeah, we hope. I do too. I do too. We're talking about identity today and perception versus reality. Um, I was looking into artificial intelligence. There's been a lot in the news lately about that. Wow, we're close today, aren't we? Hello, ladies. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you all. Welcome to Bible study this morning. Um, so I've been looking into artificial intelligence, and here's, here's a little bit about what's happening in the tech world. For decades, neuroscientists have been trying to decipher what people are thinking from their brain activity. Now, thanks to an explosion in artificial intelligence, we can decipher patterns in brain scans that once looked just like meaningless squiggles. Nobody dreamed that you could get to the content of thought like we've been able to in the past 10 years. It was considered science fiction says Marcel Just at Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania. Ladies, get this. Researchers have already peered into the brain to recreate films people have watched and decoded dreams. Scientists at the University of California, San Francisco, have created a mind-reading device that turns mental activity into text with better than 90% accuracy. Can you believe that? Think of what that means. That means as a Bible teacher up here, I can know, like if I, I could know if you're tracking with me. <laughs> I can know, are you really tracking with me? Are you thinking about the to-do list or grocery list or the argument you had last night with a friend or a spouse? I can know if you're reacting positively or negatively to my words with 90% accuracy. Even Facebook has a mind reading project in the works. The social networking company Secret of Building 8 division is working on a way for users to send Facebook messages using thoughts alone. I know, it's shocking, isn't it? Think, someday we could just come to Bible study and not speak a word. We could just think about it and we'd know each other's thoughts. Now, imagine with me that within Facebook's secretive building eight division, there's a new project dubbed Opie for Omniscient Plus. The idea behind Opie is that when a person posts a message or a photo, a corresponding message or photo is posted that highlights the internal picture of the heart and the mind. Similar to the video we just watched, there's a perceived image that the, that the user wants to put out there, but Facebook switches it up with the reality. Boy, it got quiet, ladies. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Beth, I know you're not online. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is complicated technology. Basically, it's saying that artificial intelligence can read your mind and know what's going on in the inside. And what if instead of we post this sweet picture of... Um, I don't know, we're out to dinner with our hubby and we post this sweet picture, but the reality is we weren't having fun just 10 minutes ago. We were having a very serious conversation. Ladies, what would we even post? Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> Nothing Beth says. That was quick too, Beth. Nothing. One thing is for sure, we would need to have a good understanding of what the true reality is in us. 
right? Um, what is our true identity? But that's how we should be living. God has given his spirit. And we have his spirit living within us. And if we're living in that reality with that identity, then what we post should reflect that, right? How we live should reflect that. That's what Paul's been saying in Galatians chapter 5 and, in, uh, and, and start heading into Galatians 6. Here's what it looks like to live in the spirit. <laughs> when the inside is full of the spirit, we could say, all right, bring on Opie. It's okay, because I'm going to reflect Christ in all that I do. But it sure does bring up tension for us, ladies, doesn't it? And I have heard, I have, I've felt the tension as we go work our way through Galatians. I think all of us have struggled a little bit with, okay, what does it mean to live in the spirit? But I'm still in this flesh. And so I, there, there's the flesh opposing against the spirit that we talked about last week. We're in that age we talked about in the beginning where it's the, what theologians term the already but not yet. Christ has already come. He's already died on the cross for our sins, but we're not yet fully sanctified. So we live with this tension. And certainly this is where Paul, this is Paul's message to the Galatians. He's He's directing them. He, he's telling them, look, your perception of reality is, is not right. Your perception of your identity in Christ is not right. And they, they're currently having what I'm just calling an identity crisis. Do I need, am I saved by works? Am I saved by Christ? Am I saved by works plus Christ? There's an identity crisis and he's been exhorting them over and over and over again we see it again in Galatians chapter 6 to know their true identity we're gonna dig into that a little bit ladies Galatians at the very beginning of our study we also talked about how Paul Paul's letter to the Galatians uh, follows this pattern of Hellenistic letter writing style. Do you remember we talked about how the introduction is a little bit different than his other letters? There's not this time of thanksgiving in the beginning. He digs right into the, into the point because this is a rebuke letter. And rebuke letters were written not to just any old person. A rebuke letter was written to someone you knew really well really well but we see we see evidence of this being a rebuke letter here in his conclusion um, normally if we look at his other letters what we're going to see in a conclusion are things like uh, a final greeting he might say who's with him news of his current situation prayer requests instructions maybe his travel plans and then he would give a closing benediction but that's not true with the Galatians letter, is it? No, that's not true. He tosses out the niceties, and what does he do? He takes the stylus from his assistant, and he gets to the point with his own hand. He writes this out with his own hand and summarizes his case, summarizes the argument that he's been making. So Galatians is, I feel like Galatians chapter 6 is broken up into two parts. The first part looks like, okay, what does love look like? How do we serve one another? And the second part is, again, him giving the same message. It's his, it is, uh, my, my Bible calls it the final warning. He's just saying the same message all over again. So in verse 11, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised. So what? That they may boast in your flesh. 
They desire to have you circumcised. Why? So that they can boast in their flesh. I don't know. I feel that kind of reminds me of Facebook a little bit. You know, how many friends do you have? Are you boasting? Are you really looking for friends? Or you want to be able to boast in the number of friends that you have? Paul, <laughs> wow, he, yeah, Paul, what, what's Paul saying that matters? But far be it for, for, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And here we go, ladies. Here's, here's the message. I think we've probably heard it. I didn't double check this, but in almost every single chapter. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. We saw last, last week for neither uh, circumcision nor un, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Faith working through love, new creation. So I feel like Paul is saying something like, you know, he's, he's just saying, thanks to the Judaizers, these Galatians have this perception that by circumcision and following rules, following dietary rules, they are dressed for success. By circumcision and following rules, following the law, they're dressed, they'll be dressed for success. But what's the reality? The reality is those are meaningless. It doesn't matter if you have a shirt and tie on if you're not wearing your pants. <laughs> it's meaningless what's on the outside. The outside is dressed up, but the inside, the inside, ladies, we've been saying all along, the inside are dirt bags, are goofballs like this guy that need Christ, that need Christ, that need a relationship with Jesus. We've been learning all the way through that he is enough. And once again, we see Paul say, that you need to be a new creation. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But let's think back again to the beginning of our study. What do we know about Paul? What do we know about Paul? Well, he was a former Pharisee. He, uh, he's able, I feel like he's able to call out conceit and deceit or deceptive thinking because he was once conceited and living by deceived thinking. Um, I, it's almost like he could say, I had that wig on. I had that wig on. I was, I, I was circumcised. He was circumcised and he was looking, he was looking super religious, even persecuting the Christians. On the outside, that's what he looked like, super religious. But the reality, dirt bag on the inside. I was thinking about that last night, you know, how Pastor Mike uses that term and, and thinking, would Paul use the term dirtbag? I was imagining, I don't know, my, do you, I hope you ladies have an imagination that just goes wild. I'm imagining Pastor Mike meeting Paul in heaven and, and Paul saying something like, yeah, Mike, I like that term dirtbag. I definitely <laughs> fell into dirtbag category before, before meeting Christ on that road to Damascus when the light of the world came to me and reflected the dirt to me. What do we see? We see, did Paul's life change? Radically, radically. He was heading in one direction and completely went the opposite direction. He repented. He received the Spirit. He was baptized. And what did he do? He immediately went out to proclaim Jesus as the Christ. <laughs> do you know what humility that took? <laughs> to be going this direction, to be a bigwig, going, oh, that, that was a bad pun. 
big wig. <laughs> I just, hello, that's, okay, forget that. He's heading in this direction and turns and heads this direction. That took humility. Ladies, please don't see Paul as an arrogant man. He's speaking truth, but he's not arrogant. He knows he's a dirtbag saved by grace and grace alone. <laughs> Paul is changed, and he boasts in one thing alone. Verse 14, but far be it from, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He boasts in one thing alone, and that's Jesus and the cross. Paul's identity is firmly planted in Christ, firmly planted in Christ. He's always pointing to the cross and always pointing to Christ. If you continue on with us next semester, we're going to see it in Ephesians and Philippians as well. His message is always Christ. So that now, his, what is his perceived image, who he thinks he is, really does align with reality. His identity is true. The perception and the reality correspond to one another. This is... Maybe his letter is a little bit like posting on Facebook. What he says is true. He knows his identity. It all aligns together. He's the real deal. And he, he exhorts the Galatians to know the real deal. Verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but a new creation. Have you got tired of hearing that message? I, a, a little bit. Let's not get tired of hearing that message, though. What's he saying? All that's needed is Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. All that's needed is that we become new creations. New creations. And as his new creation, we've talked about this in our study, he sends his spirit to live inside of us, to transform us, to make the inside, to make the perceived match up with the outside, the reality, to make it all mesh together as, as um, I don't know, I, I think of inside out beauty. You know, it doesn't matter how we dress this up. What matters is what comes from in here. Ladies, that's, I, I got to tell you, that's true as a teacher. You wouldn't be here sitting, listening to me just because maybe I, I got a nice outfit. Thank you, Tish, says I look great. You wouldn't be here just to listen to somebody who is dressed up on the outside. Oh, I hope and pray that what comes out here is coming from the inside of the heart. That's where we want to live. That's where Paul lives. That's where Paul lives. He's saying, be a new creation. And he admits, I mean, this is a step-by-step -step process, right? He told us, I feel like Galatians 6 really starts at Galatians 5.25. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. What does that mean? We're just taking steps, step forward. Keep, keep walking forward. This is a step-by-step -step process. We're not immediately transformed and living perfect lives. Paul says, let us keep in step with the Spirit to conform with Him, to live carefully according to his requirements. It's like marching in a straight line with God. And we talked about it last week as God's children, and that's what he's done. He's adopted us. He's made us his children. Um, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, as his children, we actively participate. We talked about having chores to do. 
And that, what's that look like, ladies? That just, that looks like loving others. Loving and serving others. Paul says, obey God's law of love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That was from Galatians 5. The fruit is what is on the inside. The fruit is what is on the inside. Our works of the flesh, we wear on the outside, right? Whether, whether those are what that list that he gave us in Galatians 5, or this list he gives at the beginning of Galatians 6, which has some warnings and it has some works for us to do, too. Those are external works. But what matters is the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is on the inside. That's the inside-out beauty. Um, Dave and I went to an apple orchard on Saturday. Don't you love fall? I just love, oh, it's been glorious, too. So beautiful. I really enjoyed walks outdoors, and I always like the fall apples. We went to an orchard. And on Saturdays, they have, you know, you can, they're cutting slices, so you can taste the different varieties. And basically, you know, the apples all kind of look like an apple, right? You know when you look at an apple that it's an apple. Sort of like we're all people. But they vary a little bit on the outside. There's different colors of red and green and yellow and combinations of all those colors. So that they, they really kind of look similar. You don't know if you want an apple until you bite into it and taste it. We got to taste several, and some are sweet, some are tart. Ladies, same for the fruit of the Spirit. If we think about what's on the inside, if somebody could take a bite of you, <laughs> what would they taste? What would they taste? If we're walking in step with the Spirit, Paul says it should taste Kind of like these things that he wrote here. It should taste like this. Um, he gives us, I, I printed it out. Can I just borrow some, or maybe take an extra one? Thank you. Hello again. Um, I call this the lettuce chapter. <laughs> because, I, and I know, that's so corny and bad. Um, but there's so many let us, let us do this. And again, that, that began back in chapter, the, the two verses previous. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Let us not provoke one another. Let us not envy one another. In gentleness, now there's a combination of let us statements and imperatives. We talked about imperatives last week. In gentleness, restore our brothers and sisters caught in sin. Let us keep watch on ourselves. Bear one another's burdens. Let us test our own work. Another imperative, share with our teachers. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow. And uh, two more let us statements. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If we do not give up, let us do good to everyone. Wow. <laughs> Ladies, that's a lot. I was like, this is just, this is a big salad bowl of let us do some things, right? He's giving us some help on, all right, we talked a little bit about this last week. We're now adopted into his family. How do we live as a family? How do we express our love to God who has rescued us, redeemed us, saved us from our sin? How do we express our love to him? And how do we live together as brothers and sisters in Christ? He's giving us some specific ways that we can, that we can love. So this is a little bit much for me. I, I would have fun just going through this list and unpacking them all. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to touch on a few of them. But I suggest around the tables today, share with one another which one, this was one of the questions in day five, but which one of these exhortations jumped off the page to you this week? Which one just jumped off the page? 
Um, I'll tell you for myself, last week I was, I, it was a week ago, Tuesday night, I was just feeling tired and weary. And I don't know, ladies, if you ever do this, but I can go into pity party mode. Like, why am I doing all of this? Why do I do this for these people? And why am I working for, you know, <laughs> thank you, Beth. <laughs> you, yeah, let's go, you want a pity party together? <laughs> yeah. And the next day came to, the next morning came to Bible study, and I thought we had a great time Wednesday morning, and I was, I don't know, I was feeling encouraged, and then we went, our small group leaders, we meet after this at noon down in 123 to discuss, we were, last week we were discussing this week's lesson, Galatians chapter 6, and so one of the leaders was reading the scripture and when she said, when she was reading, it was like, okay, this is, this is how the Spirit spoke it to me. She didn't yell this, but it was like he yelled it. Let us not grow weary of doing good. It was as, and I was like, wow, it just jumped off the page to me. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Verse 9, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Do good to all. He's saying in this passage, do good to all. Restore your brothers and sisters. Share with them. Bear each other's burdens. Oh, I'd love to hang out there for a little while. Do good. Why, ladies? Why do good? Why do good? It looks like we're following the law again. Do we really need to do that? Yes, we do. We're part of his family. Why do we do good? He did good to us. He did good to us, and we do good out of grateful hearts for what he has done for us. Let us not grow weary of doing good. We do good because he did good. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Not to be served, but to serve. That one gets me every time. Who else wants their husband to serve them? <laughs> Our identity is in Jesus Christ. That's the reality. If we have the Spirit living in us, so let's be do-gooders. Let's be do-girders. Maybe around your table, I was thinking, it's always good to be held accountable a little bit. Let's share one way we're going to do good to somebody when we leave here. Do good to somebody today. I, was, I had down in my notes this week, do good to somebody this week, but let's do good to somebody today when we leave here. There's a whole list of exhortations here. I just... I can't help but touch on a couple of them, ladies. I wanted to touch on this one last week, but there wasn't time. Galatians 5.26, if we are keeping in step with the Spirit, what does Paul say? Let us not become conceited. Let us not pro provoke one another or envy one another. Boy, got quiet again. We could sit there the rest of the day, couldn't we? Just pondering that. Just pondering that. Let us not become conceited. What is it with pride? What is it with pride? The Greek word for conceit literally means empty of glory. Conceit. Empty of glory. Or vain glory. So ladies... What does that mean? Conceit is a deep, deep insecurity. Conceit is a deep insecurity. It's a perceived absence of honor and glory. Such that someone needs to prove that. We need to prove our worth. If we're feeling we have no honor and glory, then we need to prove our worth to ourselves and to others. And what does it lead to? Conceit leads to provoking and envying. Provoking is competing, challenging. 
challenging someone to a contest. Envy, mm. envy, wanting something that belongs to someone else or not wanting them to have that thing that you want. Envy, wanting something that belongs to someone else or not wanting them to have that thing that you want. Ugh, ladies. The lizard right here. Tell the spirit to kill it and quick, fast. Pride, John Stott says this, pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. Pride is our greatest enemy. Humility is our greatest friend. Paul is saying, let us not be conceited. Let us be humble. Humble. Why, ladies? I was thinking about it. At first I was thinking, you know, okay, we should just keep in mind. He, he also got, goes on to say, let us not be deceived. The reality is we are dirtbags saved by grace. But is that the reason that we stay humble. No, that's kind of self-deprecating. Uh, I mean, there is that reality, and yes, we should keep that in mind, but I think the bigger reason to be humble is the same as why be good, because he was good to us. Be humble because he is humble. Be humble because Christ is humble. That's his spirit living within us. Think about it. What was the purpose of the crucifixion? Why would God choose to take on a human, this human flesh and die by crucifixion? The purpose of crucifixion was to die by humiliation. That's why the Romans performed crucifixion. It was to humiliate that person. What does it say about our God, that he would be humiliated, that he would choose to leave his glory and be humiliated on the cross. Boy, I think it shows he does not care about status in the least. He is humble. He is humble. Let us not be conceited, ladies. And Paul, in here, he says, do not be deceived. Ladies, the reality is we can't fake it until we make it. We just can't. We can have the shirt and the tie on and put on the wig, but we are not dressed for success without Christ, without his spirit. And we will reap what we sow. kind of hard because we don't like to we don't like to be found out I, don't we I mean I think that's where the tension lies we all sit here around the tables I, I, I mean I, I, I maybe I should just say I'm here sometimes as I looking good on the outside but how much do I really want to bear like if I bared it all would you like me <coughs> Don't we sit around? We struggle with that even as we answer questions around the tables. What are you going to think of my answer? What are you going to think of me? We don't like to be found out. I, um, you all know I have four kids, and maybe I, I tend to repeat stories. I'm sorry. Maybe I've reached that age. Um, <laughs> I have four kids, and I, I think I, I probably have shared this. I'm sorry if it's a repeat, but Mary, my youngest one, she always would leave these little encouraging notes for everyone in the whole family. She had the gift of encouragement from an itty-bitty age, and they'd be sweet notes, you know, and I, I would love, I love these notes. I'd find one on my pillow or the bathroom sink, the kitchen sink, and um you know, she was the youngest, so the other three were turning into teenagers, right? And we're getting to that attitude, but I'm still getting these sweet notes from Mary. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, sometimes I remember, and she remembers saying this too, 
Mommy, I don't know what's wrong with them. I will never act like that. <laughs> <laughs> she laughs about that now, too. <laughs> but um, there is something that happens. The way children develop, ladies, is that they must go through that. We must go through a time of rebellion. And it is way better to do that as a teenager than to do that in your mid-30s. Children need to go through that time of rebellion. And so God has designed, uh, you know, we could talk about childhood development and the way, their brain, uh, the way our brains develop. But somewhere, and I say it's about the age of 10, children begin to ask why. Like, you might see a little three or four-year-old asking, why, Mommy, why, Mommy? It's not really with the understanding, with a lot of understanding. They've just learned to ask why. But at age 10, they really begin contemplating everything. And so Mary's, Mary always signed her notes with this, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I know, still melts my heart. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Do you know what happened when she turned 10? <laughs> I get this sweet little note. It was on my bed. I remember right where it was because it cut. Mommy, she said all these nice things, and then she signed it. Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be almost like you. <laughs> Um, I took it to my husband crying. I'm like, Dave, she's figured it out. <laughs> we don't want to be found out, do we? We don't want to be found out. But it really is okay, ladies. It's okay to be found out. God already knows us. He looks into the heart. And that's why Paul here says... Test your own work. Test your own work, for each will have to bear his own load. We can bear each other's burdens, ladies, and we should. And I think you're doing a great job, even around the tables, of praying for one another and encouraging one another. We bear each other's burdens, but there's going to be a day where we have to bear our own load. We've seen it on that one video. Our resume is not going to cut it, is it? Our resume is not going to cut it. And our friends aren't going to be able to stick up for us at that time. We will have to bear our own load. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but a new creation. Ladies, God is doing a new thing. And when we look at the Bible, this this. Uh, this last half of the Bible is called the New Testament. He's telling the story of the new thing that he is doing. He's making us into new creations. There's a new covenant, the New Testament, new birth, new man, new commandments, new life. And he is doing that with his spirit that is within us, making us new day by day. It's okay to be found out if, if we put our pants on, <laughs> if we have Christ with us, if we have his spirit with us, it's okay. Why? Because then perception matches identity. He knows it all. He knows it all. We want it to be all aligned. <laughs> uh, God does see the reality of what's on the inside. But I just I want to end by just encouraging us, ladies. He loves us anyway. He loves dirt bags. He loves goofballs. How do we know his word tells us? Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, God shows his love for us. Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be perfect. He's making us perfect himself. 
he dresses us in his righteousness. Such that Paul can say, ladies, <laughs> what does Paul say? He's got the, he's sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it fundamentally changes what he boasts in. It should fundamentally change what we boast in. It changes. Why? Because it changes the whole basis of my identity. It changes the whole basis of my, of my identity. We don't, we don't just go out today and do something good for someone because it makes us feel good. We go out because it points to him. It points to him and our identity in him. Like Paul, we ought to be able to say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You know, um, I like to, I, I know I've said this several times, and I, I often say, okay, ladies, you are lovable, such that we can say, I am lovable, valuable, forgivable, changeable, never alone. And that all sounds good, but it also sounds like it could be psychobabble, kind of, right? Just a feel-good message. It's not. We've seen it in this book of Galatians now. We see where, where this is promised to us. Well, how can I say I am lovable? We've seen I am chosen. He loves me. He chose me. So it's okay, ladies, to say I am lovable. To my God, I am lovable. Some of us didn't grow up with that message. I was talking to a woman yesterday. Wow, did she have a hard childhood. A mean father. She didn't grow up hearing, I love you. With Christ, we can boast in him and boast in the cross, and we can know that we are lovable. We can also say, I am valuable. How do we know that? We know because Christ just that we've seen in his word, Christ justifies me. He's redeemed me, as Paul says. What does that mean? He paid the ransom. He paid the most costly ransom of his very own life. That makes me valuable. I am forgivable. Why? Because Christ and the cross, he's justified me. That makes me forgivable. Along with that, eternity waits for us in that we are forgiven. We are changeable. Why? We've seen it, ladies. He's given us his spirit that's transforming us day by day. We are changeable in that we are becoming, he's made us a new creation. He's making us new day by day. Why well, cling to that one? His mercies are new each morning. His mercies are new each hour if it's been a bad morning, ladies. We are changeable. And we are never alone. I am lovable, I am valuable, I am forgivable, I am changeable, and I am never alone. What's Paul told us? He's given us his spirit to walk step by step with me. Christ lives in me. Ladies, it's my prayer that we will claim that true identity as we wrap up Galatians today and next week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done for us. We praise you for your humble, gentle spirit, Lord. That you would come, that you would um, throw off your glorious status and come on our behalf and subject yourself to the humiliation of the cross to bear our sins, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that walks step by step with us, that knows us full well, Lord. 
and it covers us. I pray that you would help us to live completely surrendered to you, cooperating with you and your good transforming work in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. And God, I pray um, that you would just do that so that we can live to bring you glory. May that be our all-out purpose for this day and the days ahead, that we would live to bring you glory as Paul does. God, I pray for each and every woman here that, 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 that we would have hearts set free as Paul's heart is free, Lord. Free to live and bear fruit for you and bring glory to you. Help us to walk with you, to be do-gooders, to not be conceited, but to walk in your humble heart. Just, Lord, I just think of being one, like a one heart with you, humble and gentle, doing good, bearing one another's burdens. Yes, Lord, may we live to bring you glory. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.